family, thank you for joining us this Sunday. We are so grateful that you decided to be here with us today. My name is Ayana Taylor and I have the pleasure of welcoming you into service. There are so many places and spaces that you could have gone to today, but you chose to be here with us. We have prayed for you. We have asked for your presence here so that you can receive the word that God has for you today. Um, we want to send a special shout out to our first time visitors. If this is your first time joining the New Life community, we ask that you put that in the chat so that we can properly welcome you into the room. Whether you're in Atlanta, Savannah, uh, I don't know, Africa, we've had a few people from there. We are just so grateful that you decided to be here with us today. You have the opportunity to engage in the chat, connect with other people, um, let us know what it is that's resonating with you as we hear the word today. You'll also have an opportunity to connect with us deeper at the end of service. There will be a link that's dropped in the chat. You'll click that link. It'll take you to a Zoom room where you can learn more about what we're doing at New Life and the ways that we are impacting our local community. We are dreaming. We are asking God for bigger, for greater, and we want you to be connected with us so that you can be a part of that journey. Also, if you'd like to um, connect deeper with Christ, you'll have that uh, opportunity to do so in that space as well. And before we go into, the, into a service, we'd like to prepare our hearts and minds in all the ways that are necessary. And I'd like to share a scripture with you. And it's Psalms 105, um, 5 and 6. It says, remember the wonders he has performed, his miracles and the rulings he has given, you children of his servant Abraham, you descendants of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord, our God. His justice is seen throughout the land. He always stands by his covenant, the commitment he made to a thousand generations. And what that says is we need to remember the ways that he has moved in our lives. It's so easy to, to get to a place where we are not comfortable, we are not content, but it is when we remember the ways that God has moved in past seasons of our lives that we're able to show up and to be the children of God that he has called us to be. He had you then, he has you now, and you are here today to worship and to give him all of your heart so that he can meet you right where you are. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for all the ways that you have moved in our lives, your miraculous wonders, um, the things that we asked you for that you delivered on, God. You did it then and you will do it now. You will meet us here as we worship you, as we praise you. You inhabit the praises of your people and we are just asking for a fresh wind to flow through this place. Place today for our eyes to be open for our ears to listen to hear the Word of God that you have for us today we want to move with you we want to step in the ways that you have asked us to so we just ask Lord that you make us attuned and connected and aligned with everything that you want to speak over us today let us be change agents for your grace for your mercy and for your love we just praise you and we thank you for all the ways that you have shown up in our lives. Your word is so good, God. It says that you are Lord, that you are our God. We thank you. We praise you for what you're gonna do today. Bless Pastor Harris and all of the people that will be sharing today. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen again. We thank you, Lord. As we move into certain you're going to be in for a treat today as we dive deeper into family relationship and all the ways that God has called us to show up in the lives of others. How far 
you've fallen, how much you've messed up, how much you've missed it, God is madly in love with you. He loves you in spite of you, in spite of your mess, your mistakes. He loves you in spite of what you've done, what you think, where you've gone. He loves you. I've made so many mistakes in my life, I didn't think anybody would want me, that God couldn't get anything out of me. Have you ever been there where you've been so lost and so confused and so hurting that you don't think there's any hope for you at all? And lo and behold, Jesus comes and nudges you on the shoulder and says, I still have a plan for you. Y'all just begin to worship God, begin to honor Him. Y'all do know it is an honor and a privilege to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Our God is good and He's awesome. Amen. 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 I want to read to you a portion of the 133rd Psalm. It says this. To sum up David, it says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. For it is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It, talking about unity and corporate worship, is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded, there the Lord commanded his blessings forever. I just want to encourage you guys to be consistent in your corporate worship. That particular song was a song of David that the children of Israel would sing as they were marching up to Jerusalem to worship. There was an excitement that they had in their voice about meeting other believers. And so there's an anointing church that gets poured out of God. And when you're at Six Flags on the ride or you're at your job, there are certain places that anointing won't it won't run down but when you come into the place of God how many of y'all know that God has promised to meet us here and when you come into the house of the Lord there is a blessing and a grace over your life that you can't get in private worship you can only get it in public worship so I want y'all to just be consistent because the enemy knows the the grace and the blessing that's over your life and how many of y'all know he'll give you all the excuses in the world to avoid corporate worship? But you guys have come in here today. You had to push towards the ears that said, don't come. You had to push towards family members who wouldn't come. And so you're here now. You might as well lift your hand and say, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I honor you. Lord, I bless you. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, we magnify you. Thank you for the opportunity to worship God. Thank you. Let us pray. God, we thank you for who you are and what you have done. God, there's so many who would love to have our seats this morning that could not make it. But God, you have blessed us. God, I pray for those who are watching online who have gathered around their smartphones and gathered around their computers. God, I pray that the anointing that's here would go through the airwaves and go into homes, God. Bless those who are worshiping with us, whether they're here or whether they're at home. Lord, this is your hour. And so, God, we give it up to you. We leave everything we got, God, right here. So, God, bless us. Be with us. God, save those who are lost. Deliver those who are bound. In Jesus' name, 
Come on, church, let's worship him together. Would you just open up your mouth and give him a hallelujah? Give him a thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, we bless you. He inhabits in the praises of his people. He inhabits in the praises of his people. And we're gonna worship him on this morning. Because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is liberty. Come on, y'all, we're gonna lift up the name of Jesus on this morning. I feel victory in the room and I just thank God. I thank God for his power. Let's lift him up this morning. Woo! Come on, y'all. Let's put our hands together this morning. Yes. We love to call your name. It's something we cannot explain. That happens when we proclaim your great name. Your great name. We love to call your name. Something we cannot explain. That happens when we proclaim your great name. Say your great name. Over my family, there is power in the name of Jesus. Speak it over my job, I do. Power in your name. I speak it over my mind. Oh. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is so much power. Power in your name. Say, call it back. Things change when we call you Jesus. Things change. Things change when we call your name. Say, things change.
call Wesley nothing happens you can call Nicole nothing happens you can call pastor and nothing happens but when you call on the name of Jesus Christ there is deliverance there is healing hallelujah call on his name I don't know about y'all, but there have been days when I couldn't even pray. All I could do is say, Jesus, Lord, help. And he showed up. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't know what you're going through today, but I want to encourage you that when you neglect the name of Jesus, you forfeit a power that can be found in no other name. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. God, thank you for deliverance. There is no other name whereby man can be saved than through and by your name Jesus and so I call you now I just want to say Jesus Lord somebody needs you in here today Jesus Lord somebody got a diagnosis this week Jesus somebody has a daughter or a son that's out there that they've been praying for Jesus God, somebody has a marriage that's on the rocks. Jesus, we give it over to you. God, we love you. We bless you. We thank you. In your son Jesus' name, amen. 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 Before you take your seat, would you just give him a hand clap of praise? Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you. I want to thank those of you who are worshiping with us for the first time. If you're in here and this is your first time worshiping with us, uh, would you just let us know who you are, where you are, if this is your first. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Wave your hands. Wave at me so we can see who you are. Uh, we know that God has led you here. And I can promise you that if you would open up your heart and be receptive, that God is going to say some things to you today that's not only going to change your life, but it's going to change your family's life. Amen. 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 And those of you who are worshiping with us online, thank you as well. And the anointing that flows here flows to your house as well. And so, New Life, would you just help me welcome those who are worshiping with us for the first time, whether here or online. Amen. Amen. Come on, Pastor. Praise the Lord, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's give God praise this morning. It's a beautiful day. It's a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord. How many of you are glad to be in the Lord's house? 
God is good. He's good all the time, all the time. Welcome to each of you. Just honored to worship with you this morning. So glad that you have come out of the house of the Lord to worship. Of course, those of you that are online just want to say a big, big, big welcome to each of you, a part of our online family. We honor God for you being present this morning. We're just excited to be in the Lord's house, to worship Him, to hear His word, and to celebrate who He is. We have a young, young man, a young baby to dedicate to the Lord today. And I really want us to get a chance to meet him. I'm going to ask if the parents of Azai, if the parents of Azai Moore, Deandra and Amanda Moore, if you would please bring Azai to the altar so we can get an opportunity to dedicate him to the Lord today. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Help me give a real, real, real big, big welcome to this mom and dad and this family. Would you help us do that? Come on, let's thank God for them. doing good good to see you both good to see you both I um, want to dedicate this young man he is precious Wow he's so precious well before I dedicate him I want to talk to the both of you is that okay you guys are parents to this young man and you are starting your life and starting your family together and I want you to know how wonderful it is to see young couples in love with God and each other and guiding a family. So the Lord speaks to us about children and one of his topics that he talks about when he speaks about kids is how precious they are. Um, he describes our faith, right, as adults. He describes our faith in terms of a child. He says that we have to have the faith of a child. He actually says, unless we come as children, we can't even see the kingdom of God. He said, suffer the children to come to me and don't stop them. That there should be a constant progression of Azai and whatever other children you may have in your future, constantly coming to Jesus, coming to him. Now, he doesn't know the Lord Jesus yet. He'll get to know Jesus through the both of you. As he sees Christ in your life, you become the picture of the Lord Jesus to him. Our children don't have a concept of God early on in their lives. They haven't reached that intellectual place where they can understand God. They know him intuitively, of course, but not, not cognitively. And they understand God by watching dad and mom. They understand love by watching the way you love each other. They understand their value and how God sees them by the way that you see them. You become the first Jesus that your children will ever see. The greatest gift you can give to a Zai is not clothes or a good education or a 401k for his future or whatever it is called. The greatest gift you can give him is a loving relationship between the two of you. A good marriage that honors God is the greatest gift to give to a child. Helping him see the Lord Jesus. So you got a big job on you, a huge job. Can I pray for you? Would you pray with me for this family? Father, I lay my hands upon the head of this dad and I bless this young man in Jesus name I thank you for his wisdom his strength his courage I pray God that you would give him insight and vision I pray that he would lead his family as you lead him I pray that you would speak to his heart that God he would hear your voice talking to him in the early hours of the morning that he would never doubt or question who you are in his life that you would make his arms strong with love, his heart beat with passion, make his ears sensitive to your voice and give him a strong faith 
And I thank you, God, that he will stand against the enemies that come against his home with the word of God. And I thank you for him in Jesus' name. I lay my hands upon this mom and I pray for her strength, her grace. I pray, God, that you would give her the kind of faith that rivals the women of the scriptures. I pray, Lord, that you would fill her with your spirit. Let wisdom flow from her mouth. I pray that she would see you in everything that she does, that all things she puts her hands to, that they would prosper. I thank you that she will embody a Proverbs 31 woman, that she'll be virtuous inside and out, that her son will see her and see the kind of woman that he is to marry. I I thank you, God, that she will be a role model and a trendsetter for her home and friends of her home, that other young women will look at her and see how you are supposed to live for God. So I thank you now that you're speaking into her life. Anoint her with a special grace on her heart so that she makes her home a safe haven for her family. And I'll give your name praise in Jesus' Jesus name amen and amen again all right may I dedicate your son right. hey young man how are you I lay my hands upon this young man's head and I declare that his your grace flows to his life I thank you, God, that nothing in his life is missing, that his hands belong to you. Anoint everything this young man touches in his life. I pray that his feet walk in the direction that you're guiding him, that, Lord, every step he takes is a providential, ordained, divine step. I pray that his knees would bend to you and God that he would fall on these knees every time his shoulders get heavy. I thank you God that his heart beats for you, that you fill him with your spirit. Save him, I pray in Jesus name. Make him a man of God, a father of children, a husband to one wife. Allow him to be one that others look to. Make him a leader in Jesus' name. I give your name praise. And all God's people said, amen and amen again. In Jesus' name, I bless you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, in Jesus' name, amen. I present to the church Azai Moore, Azai Moore. Come on and give God praise for this young man. He is the grandson of one of our staff members, Ms. Tawanda Moore, and she allows, uh, she's over our motel to home program, and she's helped so many um, single moms and families move out of temporary housing into stable housing and it's just a blessing to dedicate her grandson to the lord i love you guys thank you so much you may return to your seat help me give god praise one more time for this family amen amen all right, well, there's a couple things going on at the church on this coming week, and um, I want you to be aware of them. I'm going to need a little bit of help this morning, so if you could, uh, those of you, the guys in the back, if you could put it on the screen, so I'll know what it is that we're doing. Amen. <laughs> All right, yes, Bible Land. Bible Land is happening. We are excited about Bible Land. Amen. Very excited about Bible Land. Um, it's going to take place on October 31st. So everybody, please be aware that Bible Land is our alternative to Halloween celebrations, right? So we don't celebrate death. We celebrate life. We are not people who are uh, celebrating fear. We celebrate faith. Amen. So we don't celebrate uh, Halloween, but we know that our culture does, and we don't want our children to go to school the next day, and they didn't have an opportunity to talk about their candy and fun that they 
they had for Halloween. So we decided to turn our gymnasium into a full Bible land experience for our kids. Um, we're going to come with actors and actresses walking through about five or six of the I am statements of Jesus. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. We're going to act out those uh, statements and we've got actors and actresses where we're going to have actors and actresses uh, set designs and our kids are going to have an amazing time. So please make certain that your child and all the kids in your neighborhood and family are at Bible Land. Now a couple things we need. Number one, we need candy. We need candy. Amen. I didn't hear a big enough amen on that. We need candy. Amen. So I'm asking you to please go to Walgreens, Walmart, Target, all the places where you get candy and buy bags of candy. Not one thing of candy, but a bag of candy. Amen. Please bring it to the church on any Sunday. Put it in the bins. You only got a couple more Sundays left or any day during the week. You can drop it off at the top of Building 1 any day during the week uh, to bring your candy. And we also are in need of actors and actresses and volunteers, set design folks, stage setup. We need a bunch of support and help. So I'm asking you to please be a part of that experience. If you know that you can't act at all, you're just the person we're looking for. Amen. So we would love to have you come out and help us. There are two QR codes uh, that are on the screen. If you would um, scan either of those QR codes, please, if you do that, uh, you can... Find out where our Amazon wish list is, and you can also find out how to volunteer as a, as a support aid for Bible Land. Let's give God praise for Bible Land. A few weeks ago, we talked about uh, addiction, addictions of every kind, particularly in our message, we were speaking about um, uh, substance abuse addiction or alcoholism and the rest, but there's so many areas of addiction. Addiction is anything that you do that's contrary to your life and values, that, that progressively causes harm and damage to your life and the life of others, yet you cannot stop doing it. That is an addiction. And we are asking for you to be a part of a special training. It's called SOAR, SOAR training. And we're going to be talking about addictions. How do you relate to your friends and family members that are struggling with addiction? If you yourself are struggling with addiction, we're going to talk about the science of addiction, what it is and how do we understand it. We're going to be dealing with this uh, with an uh, organization that's a part of our church called STAND. They're one of our church and alliance partners. Uh, Stand Inc. and uh, they are a tremendous resource and an amazing organization that has been in recovery uh, programs and ministry for many, many years. Mr. Charles Sperling, uh, one of our church members, and LeBrian Sperling, both a father and a son, lead that organization. They're going to be here to talk through this area of addiction. We're going to do it four times, once every month, starting this month. It's going to happen on October the 28th. That's a Saturday, October the 28th at 10 o'clock in the morning. 10 o'clock in the morning, it's going to be in building number one in room 108 over in the administration building. Please make certain that you're there or someone that you know needs to be there. Encourage them to come. Now, don't. there's no stigma in coming. If you come to this, no one's going to stigmatize you with an addiction. That's not what this is about. You may need to be there to learn how to talk to a friend who is going through addiction. Or you may need to be there to learn how to talk to a family member who's in addiction. So please don't neglect this opportunity to learn and grow in the area of recovery. And all God's people said, amen to that. Amen. 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 All right, and um, environmental justice is, there's going to be a special environmental justice take action forum and listening session. If you don't know what environmental justice is, it is related to everything connected to the environment around the homes, communities, and neighborhoods of impoverished individuals or black and brown communities where the environment is not cared for or policy does not protect 
the environment of those communities as it does the environments of other communities. We're going to talk about awareness. We're going to talk about justice, actions that we can do to hold our elected officials accountable in terms of policy. We're going to discuss everything from how to detect radon in your home, and a list goes on and on. So I'm encouraging you to please be a part of this environmental justice forum. Come ready to listen and learn, especially as we have seniors in our communities who are not able to take care of themselves as easily as they could in the past, and many of them are dependent upon these kinds of legislative actions from our policymakers to protect them environmentally. As gentrification comes in the communities, folks are being moved out of their community into other less desirable neighborhoods, and so we're going to discuss all of these issues, and I want to encourage you to be present. It's going to be on Saturday the 28th, Saturday the 28th at 10, at 9.30 in the morning. Uh, it's going to be right here in the worship center in rooms 105 and 107, right in the worship center. Please do not neglect to be a part of that, uh, of that conversation. And all God's people said amen to that. Amen. All right, last thing I want to mention, and that is we are getting ready to go to Liberia, West Africa for our missions trip, and I am excited about it. We are getting ready to do this, and um, I really want you to do a few things. Number one, pray for missionaries. Pray for missionaries who are going to be on this trip. And number two, I want you to consider how the Lord would have you make a special donation for this missions trip. We are in need of several things. You can help us with backpacks for girls and boys, educational supplies, medical supplies, gloves and masks, and over-the-counter medications. But because of this time period, we're leaving the first week in November. We're leaving the first week of November, so we really need you to give a financial offering to help offset the cost for uh, our trip. Our trips to Africa normally cost us to go set up a full clinic and we do a complete clinic in, in uh, West Africa, in Liberia, um, that has uh, pediatric care, internal medicine care, um, there is uh, care for, we have dentists that go, we do full dental clinic and an eye clinic and the rest, and so we take doctors with us on these trips and we go into already established buildings that are just, um, you know, shell of a building for us here in America, just shells of the building. We're in an impoverished area of uh, Liberia and we turn that building into a medical clinic with full triage and everything else. And then we teach teachers um, in the local school systems there. So in a separate area, we're teaching educators and teachers in a local school system about education education about pedagog pedag peda about how to teach I keep trying to say that word and can't say it pedagogical that is not it but um uh, what's a pedagogy? What is that? It's not, nothing. But we teach how to teach. I don't teach them how to teach, as you can see. Um, but we take instructors and educators there, teaching about math and science and about other instructional uh, details and specifics. And, um, and then we also talk to pastors and church leaders there about uh, establishing churches, about proper doctrine, what is evangelism, how to do church polity and church governance. Um, so we go there and we share the gospel, we share the love of Christ, and we see thousands of people, literally thousands of people, no exaggeration, thousands of people coming to receive aid and help in the clinic or with our school, uh, with our, our school conference or our pastor's conference. And so we do need your help. The gospel tells us that we are to carry it to the uttermost parts of the earth, the far-reaching places of our globe. And that's what God's called us to do. And I don't think that you should go across the sea until you've gone across the street. Because we're called to go to Jerusalem first and then to Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. And so until you've gone across the street, you really shouldn't be going across the seas. Um, but you know your church and you know that we go across the street every single day. And so this is right for us 
to go to Africa to share and we need your help. So during the offering period, I would ask if you would scroll down and look for the Liberia option. It will say Liberia or International Missions and please give a generous donation to help us cover the cost of uh, this trip. Uh, many times this trip costs us above $50,000 to do. Um, but we believe God's called us to take missionaries and share the love of Christ there. So I'm asking you to please be generous today and to give. We're going to do it no matter what. Amen. Amen. Your tithes and your offerings make certain that we can do that. But I want you to know where your tithes go and how it ministers and blesses people, not just locally, but also abroad. So let's give God praise for Liberia. All right. Well, speaking of which, it's giving time. It's time to honor the Lord with our gifts. You know what we do with the income that this church receives. You know how we utilize tithes and offerings to bless people that are close and far away. And you know the heart of this church. You know the people that are blessed to minister to because of the ministry of this church. So I pray that when you give, that you'll give generously and that you'll give faithfully. Many of you wonder how to give, and I want to make certain you know that. There are three ways that you can give if you are in, uh, if you're watching my stream. You can go to our website, which is the easiest and the most common way to give, and simply go to newlife-atl, click on the home tab. There's a giving uh, option there and uh, you can give through the home screen. You can secondly give by text, by texting the word New Life ATL to the number 77977 and instructions will share with you on how you can give. And then of course, if you're watching my stream, you can send in your gifts to the address that should be on the bottom of your screen. If you're in the room, all three of those options are available to you, but there's another, and that is through envelope. There are envelopes in the seat back covers just in front of you, and you're welcome to utilize them to give. Um, and we don't receive a, we don't pass a bucket here in our church uh, at the moment, so if you would like, you can give an envelope gift through the, uh, the box receptacles at the exits before you leave the sanctuary. And all God's people said amen. If you've never given through PushPay or if you've never set up your giving on a regular basis, I would encourage you to consider doing that today and schedule out your stewardship. Amen? Amen. Father, I thank you for all that we have been blessed with. Thank you that you've called us to be a blessing. Now, Lord, turn us into rivers and not lakes. Help us to send blessings forth to those who need them. I pray for the people of Liberia that they will receive the gift of Christ from New Life Church. I thank you, God, that you've called us to minister to those in faraway lands. And now I pray that you will see to it that that is done in the name of Jesus. And all the people of God said, Amen. And Amen again. All right, let's all take out our smartphones, if you would, and let's prepare ourselves to give. Just that simple and just that easy. I want to thank all of you uh, for your generosity and for your giving. Amen. Well, we are in the second installment of our series, This Is Us on the Family. And today we're going to be talking and dealing with love and what it is and how it looks and what God has called us to in expressing it to the people that we love. So I pray that your hearts are open to receive the word of God. The word of God always finds its way to our hearts whenever it gets there through worship. 
when you're worshiping God, you tenderize your heart to receive the word of God. So I pray that you will worship him in this next set, that you won't sit and watch us worship, but that you'll be a part of that experience and open your heart for God to speak.
sing it together. When I thought I lost me, you knew where I left me. You reintroduced me to your love. You picked up all my pieces, put me back together. You are the defender of my heart. When I thought I
your hands in the presence of God, would you? 
So Father, we thank you that you are the God who loves us in spite of us. No matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, no matter what we've been through, your love always pursues us. You pursue until you overtake us. And I thank you, God. I thank you that you'll never leave us alone. You'll never leave us lonely. You'll never leave us by ourselves. You'll never forget about us. You'll never turn your back on us. You'll never turn away from us. You'll never turn your face in the opposite direction of us. But your love pursues us. It chases after us. It runs after us. It walks. It runs. It flies in our direction. We give you praise. We thank you, God. Now I pray, remind us that your love never fails. It never ends. And it never stops. You are our great defender. You are the God who loves us. Even though we're unlovely, there's nothing we've done to deserve your love. But God, you give it to us lavishly. Wow, lavishly. So we receive in Jesus' name. And every believer shouted and said, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on and give the Lord a praise. Come on and give the Lord a praise. People said, Amen. And Amen again. Bless the name of the Lord. Take your seat in the presence of the Lord. God is good. He's good all the time. How many of you all are in love with Him? How many are glad that He loves you? We love Him because He first loved us. Gave Himself for us. Gave Himself for us. Lord, may you now let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart speak, be pleasing in your sight. We pray that you would look upon what we say today and smile. So we thank you. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen again. Well, go ahead and grab your Bibles, if you would, and open them to the book of Proverbs. We'll start there again this week and just uh, serve as our launching passage for this series. Proverbs chapter 24, uh, verses 3 and verse 4. Proverbs 24, verses 3 and 4. Now, even though it'll be on the screen, I want you to um, be sure you have it uh, in your Bibles. Proverbs 24 verse 3 and 4 it says through wisdom a house is built and by understanding it is established and by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches through wisdom a house is built and by knowledge it is established and by understanding by wisdom uh, I'm sorry by understanding it is established and by knowledge the rooms are filled with all rare and precious Gifts. I want you to see the words that we covered the last time together, and that is knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. This is how you build your house. You build your house through knowledge, through understanding, and through wisdom. This is how you build your house. Now, in this series, This Is Us, that we've been teaching, uh, This Is Us, we've been talking about what is going to prove to be, and as we continue the series, countercultural ideas about family, countercultural ideas about love, countercultural ideas about how to make a home. These will be ideas that go against the culture. They don't really rub the way the culture would have us to think. And so the challenge for our mind is going to be 
emptying ourselves of the way the world tells us love, family, and marriage is to be done, and to hear this as the scriptures teach how we do family, how we do love, and how we do marriage. Now, I think the culture has proven that it is not a reliable source for that information. Look at the number of broken families, broken homes, the number of broken lives that have uh, been done because of following the cultural norms of love. And yet we still follow it because it's somehow natural to our flesh. Whenever we think about love, we think about love in carnal and fleshly ways and that is just the truth. The majority of how we see love is through carnality. We've even used the same word for loving our spouse as we do for loving our car. We use the exact same word for loving our spouse as we do for loving pizza. I mean, I love pizza, I love hot dogs, and I love my wife. I mean, it's just, you see how carnal it becomes, right? It becomes very carnal and it, it downplays the significance of love. It minimizes the weight of it. So I want us to restore it back to its original place in our life and in our thoughts. God is love. The Bible is very clear. God is love. Now, if we were to describe you, we would say that you are intelligent. We would say that you're smart. We would say that you're bright, right? We wouldn't say that you are the epitome and the embodiment of smartness. We would not say that you are the embodiment of intelligence. We would say that you have intelligence, that you are an intelligent person. We use intelligence or smart or we use um, uh, 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 any of those other uh, explanations or expressions. We use them as adjectives to describe you, not as a noun that defines you. But love is not an attribute that God has. Love is what and who God is. He is the very embodiment of love. Now think on this, if you would, if it is true, and of course it is, that God is love, that he is the embodiment of love, then that would mean you cannot love without God. Are you understanding? I mean, that's just logic. You, you, can't, you can't believe two contradictory things at the same time. You can't believe that God is love and you can't believe that you can love without God at the same time. Those are two contradictions that you cannot ascribe to simultaneously. You're going to have to abandon one for the other. Either God is love and you need him to love anyone else or God is not love and you can love without God. You cannot love without God and believe that God is love at the same time. Are you guys understanding this? Now I say that because it's critical because so many people, Christians included, Christians included try very hard and very long, I mean years and decades long to love without God. To love without God. They get married without God. They have a family without God. They go through challenges and trials in their home and household without God. They make vows and commitments before ministers and preachers and in churches with steeples or in front of judges and justices of the peace without God without God. They literally start a family. I'm not talking about an accidental family. They plan to have children and do not factor God in the process at all. So many, they think, I'm old enough now, I make enough money now, I've got a good home, I've got a good life, I think that it's time for us to start our family. And they never factor God in it at all. They raise their children from, from toddlers all the way up to high school without God, without teaching them the word of God, the ways of God, the will of God, the plan of God. Do you see how we try to love without God? 
And if you're doing that, believer or unbeliever, if you're doing that, you cannot believe that God is love. Because to believe that God is love is to love anyone through him. Through him. So that's a critical aspect. That's a critical aspect. Now, the other thing about this issue of love is that we don't know what it is. We, don't, we really don't know what love is as a culture because there's so many messages that tell us what love is that we get confused. You turn on your radio and at any given time, someone's going to be describing or defining love for you. And whenever they describe and define love for you on your radio, in the top 40, on the favorite movies that you love, those movies that make you cry and all of that, on all the great movies and all the pop culture and what is popular in our culture, the things that wins Grammys and Emmys and Tonys, the things that pack out houses and theaters, the things that get on Broadway in New York, all of these messages, many multiple messages about love. Love. And any time they're expressing love predominantly, and by predominantly, I mean in the 90 percentile, it is describing every kind of love except agapeo. Every kind of love, you can find a movie about eros, erotic love, eros. There are four, there are seven actually, but there are four that I'll give with you, uh, words for love. And one of those words is eros. Eros is sexual love. It is the love of man to woman. It is, it is this infatuated sexual love from body to body. And you can go, and you ain't got to go far to get eros. I mean, eros comes on commercials. It's... They're trying to sell soda and they've got somebody in a bikini. Try, why do you need a bikini to sell soda? Because we define love by eros. And when eros is given, we actually think that's love. And don't look at me like that, guys. How many teenagers and young adults actually believe that eros is love, erotic love is love? Many of them. I've had people say, if you love me, you'll let me. It's time for us to take our relationship to the next level. Oh, y'all got quiet. Why y'all get so quiet? Like, oh, that's wrong. I ain't, oh, I didn't know that was wrong. It's eros. And whenever you make eros agapeo, you've confused love. Are you hearing me? Or phileo. Phileo is brotherly love. It is the love of friendship. It is to love someone as a friend. It's this close affinity and affection for another person. Phileo. And many people, you can find movies and songs and you can find top 40 hits about eros and about phileo. And many of us define love with eros or we define love by phileo, having an affection for people, just loving people. I mean, we can be in an understandable separation for six years and still live together. <laughs> now, y'all know I don't care if you get quiet. And you know if you get quiet, I'm just going to talk about it longer. It's easier just to say amen and I'll move on. But it's amazing to me that the people who do that are the same people who are dishing out marriage advice. They're telling you how to be loving and happy in your home. And they don't even have a home. Are you understanding what I'm saying to you? And we gobble it up because it sounds good and it makes us feel good and we got all these good emotions going on because Jada and Will said such and such at the red table. I had them say the name because y'all don't know who I'm talking about, must be. I'm the only one in the room who knows, so. And because, and because that becomes our picture and profit of love, we think that's what love is. And it's not at all. It's the very opposite of love. Are you getting what I'm saying to you? 
when you have an arrangement where adultery is accepted, that's the opposite of what God intended. Or it is not only maybe erotic love, or not only phileo love, or there's this kind, warm love, storge. And storge is the love of family. And you got movies written about that, and they're, they're powerful, wonderful movies. Books that are written about that, and songs about family love, mama's love, and daddy's love, and sister and brother love, and love of the extended family, and auntie loved me, and big mama loved me. And that's great, wonderful, absolutely wonderful. It's wonderful. There's nothing wrong with storge gay love at all we are all products of that amen I'm teaching about family now but I need you to hear me guys please are you guys listening to me I don't think y'all listening to me if agape is not in your store gay your store gay is dysfunctional if agape is not in your storge, let me say it this way. If agape is not in your storge, then your storge will never develop and prepare you for a healthy agape relationship with your spouse. You have to have God in the home. Not just biscuits, but God. Not just mac and cheese, but God. Not just nice turkeys and pretty Christmas trees, but God. Not just stories around the campfire, but God. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? The love that the Bible says is love is the love agapeo. It is this unconditional love. It is to love because of and for no other reason. It's unconditional love. That's the love of God. Miles Monroe says, says it like this, and I love the way he put it. He says that agape love is love for no reason. It's love that doesn't need a reason. It's not only love that doesn't need a reason, but I want to add to that. It's love that does not expect reciprocation. Now that ain't normal love. The moment that I say that is a moment that is repelling so many folks in my own mind. I know that is repulsive because that is the mantra of our day. I mean, you got to give back to me. I got to get something out to deal. I want something. I want my needs met. It, that's not love. Love is without a reason and without an expectation of reciprocation. We love as God loved us. All right, so can we talk about it a little bit? We said there are four bonds in the family. There are four bonds in the family. One is love, two is loyalty, three is loss, four is legacy. Four bonds in family, love, loyalty, loss, and legacy. And I want to spend our time talking about all four of them in the case of this course of this series. They'll frame our series. The longest one is going to be our discussion about love. That will be the longest one if we get to the others, amen. If we don't, then amen. Uh, so the longest one is talking about love. Love is the first. It is the foundation of the family. It is the foundation of the family. It is what the family is built on, what the family is, is established upon, love. Now, the Bible says in Proverbs 24, 3 and 4 that we just read that a home is built by wisdom, established by understanding, and its rooms are filled with rare and precious gifts by knowledge, right? It didn't say love. It said knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. It didn't say love. Is that not right? Therefore, if love is the foundation of that family, then the knowledge, the understanding, and the wisdom has to be about how to love. It's Solomon's way of telling us that love is not just a feeling, it is a skill. It is something you have to know how to do. You have to know how to do love, not just feel love, not just intend love, not just want to love. You have to know how to love. It's a skill. For any skill that you and I have in our life, we had to learn that skill. You had to learn the skill of driving, learn the skill on your job, learn the skill of typing or the skill of being a doctor or a physician, or learn the skill of being an educator, learn the skill of being an electrician, learn the skill. All, every job and career we have in our life, there are skills attached to those jobs and you had to learn them through education, training, through years of development, through spending time under 
an apprenticeship, under mentors, having someone be a role model, watching it, reading books about it, hearing people talk about it, seeing it modeled in front of you. Every skill you have, you had to learn it. Love is no different. You will have to learn the skill of love because you build your house by knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Knowledge of what? Love. Understanding what? Love. Wisdom in what area? Love. Therefore, if I'm going to have my home built, I have got to strengthen my brain muscle and heart muscle as it relates to love. And the pure reality is many people don't know how to do it because they don't know what it is. Are you with me so far? So let's answer the first question, that is, what is love? What is love? I want to teach that love is three things. I'll give you the first one first. Love is a decision. Let the church say decision. Love is a choice. Love is a choice. Love is a choice. Love is a choice. Love is not a feeling. You don't fall in love. <laughs> Someone told an old lady, said, I fell in love. She said, baby, you better plug that hole up because you can fall out the same hole you fell in. You don't fall in love. It's not a well that you trip into. It's not something you accidentally stumble into. Love is a decision. You fall into the emotion of love, yes, but the word emotion is critical. It is motional, movement, emotions. Anything with motion moves, it's fluid, meaning it could be here today and gone tomorrow. You will not always feel the way you feel. In order for you to keep the feeling strong, you've got to love hard. Love is what keeps the feeling there. The decision refortifies the feeling not the other way around. The decision fortifies the feeling, not the feeling fortifying the decision. You don't love because you feel like loving. You love because you choose to love. And the more you choose to love, the more you choose to love, the more you choose to love, the more the feelings of love come. Feelings follow behavior. Feelings follow behavior. Feelings are interesting and funny. They are born automatically and they die automatically. When a feeling is born to keep that feeling alive, you have got to fertilize it. You've got to feed it. You've got to water it. You've got to put sunshine on it to keep the feeling alive. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? And it is the decision, the decisions, the choices that you make that feeds the feelings that you have. So when the feelings are low and you've lost that love and feeling, when you've lost that loving feeling, you've got to make a new decision. You've got to reaffirm the choice that you made. Go back and look at your wedding pictures. Go back and read your vows again. Go back and remind yourself what you love about your partner. Go back and look at how, are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Because feelings fade. Decisions are always fresh. Here it says, love is a decision to intimately accept the fullness of another person without expectation of a return. Love is a decision to intimately, I'm going to talk about that word in a little bit, intimately accept, everybody say accept, to intimately accept the fullness of another person. Now last time together I talked about individuality and individuation, remember that? Those two fancy little words that y'all fell asleep on when I was talking about them? All right, individuality is who I am in my personality and my expressions to you. It's my individuality, it's my, it's my uniqueness, it's, it's me, right? I am different from my brother who is here, Michael. He has individuality, I have individuality. I'm different from him, he's different from me. We have individuality. Are you getting what I'm saying to you? But the thing about me and Michael that has individuation is that in our individuality, we have the same last name, we have the same mom and dad. Are you getting the point? So there is an integration between the two of us even though we have separate individuality. Individuation is whenever you integrate the multiple parts of you and you bring it together to make a whole. To make a whole. Um, um, uh, the good of you and the bad of you. Individuation says, all of that is me. 
The flaws in your personality, all of that is you. The quirkiness about how you act, all of that is you. The weird things you do, all of that is you. Everything about you, good, bad, and indifferent, all of that is you. That's who you are. That's a part of what it means to be individuated. It is to be integrating all of the pieces and components of who I am that make up me. That's called fullness. You don't get individuation if you're stuck on individuality because individuality is my personality what people think about me my reputation the things they know about me how people see me individuality can be a coat that I wear on the outside but individuation is the t-shirt I wear on the inside and when we get married we show people our coat and not our t-shirt when we get married, we show them the pretty and not the ugly. And for so many people, here is what, what self-deception is. Self-deception is whenever you have believed that you are nothing but a coat and you have denied your own t-shirt. You don't know your weaknesses. You don't know the things that upset you. You don't know how you respond when you are upset. You don't know how to handle your emotions. You don't know how to deal with your feelings. You don't know how to face your fears. You don't know what ticks you, what makes you happy, what makes you sad. You have no self-awareness. And self-awareness is critical if you're going to love someone else because Jesus said you have to love others as you love yourself. And if you do not know yourself, you cannot love yourself. And many people are just learning themselves when they get into the marriage. They never knew that they thought and felt that way until they got married and said, I didn't even know that I had that tendency because you didn't know yourself in the context of loving someone else now don't feel bad because that's normal that's normal that's not I, what I just said is not it's not abnormal that's normal the purpose of family is to help you individuate who you are in fullness there's some lessons you learn in family that is difficult to learn outside of family. I'm not saying you can't learn them. I'm saying they're hard to learn. In family, you learn how to fight fair. In family, you learn how to argue and disagree and wake up in the morning and eat breakfast together. In family, you learn how to stick together when everybody else is against you. Now, I can fight you, but they bet not fight you. In family, you learn this bond, this tie between two people. You learn it in family. In family, you learn personal dignity. What it means to have a last name. What it means to have, a, are you getting what I'm saying to you? You learn these lessons in family. In family, you learn how to forgive. You learn, because you got to forgive. You got no choice. You got to see them every day. You learn how to forgive. You learn how to forbear. You learn how to receive love, how to give love, how to manage your emotions, how to cut off your words, how to manage your tongue. You learn how to encourage people, how to challenge them, how to uplift them. Are you getting what I'm saying? You learn how to fight fair in a family. In a family, you learn how to fight fair, that you can box, but don't hit me here. Now that, now, uh -uh, you can't hit there. You learn what not to do, what not to say. You learn, the, you learn the results of your words and the damage they cause to the psyche of other people. And these are things you learn when you are two, three, four, five, and six. Hear me now clearly, are you listening to me? So that by the time you are 26, you have individuated those weaknesses in your life and you've been working on them so that when you get married you already know I got a tendency to have a sharp tongue I know that I know how to fight but I ain't gonna say that because that there is below the belt you don't fight fair that way I know how to forgive that sting that hurt but I've learned how to forgive 
Are you getting the idea? Now, I'm not saying you can't learn it any other way. Of course you can. I had to, so you know I believe you can. Here's what I am saying. That when you're in a family, a family allows you the opportunity to get to know you. And you will never get to know you until you rub up with somebody else. Because it is in relationship with other people that we see the value and virtues and vices of our own lives. Ah, is anybody hearing this? All right. And so love is a decision. Love is a decision to intimately accept the fullness the good, the bad, the ugly, the happy, the sad, the strength, the weaknesses, the fullness of another person without expectation of a return. John chapter 13, verse 34, here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you. He says, you've got all the commandments of Moses. You've got all the commandments of the Old Testament. Jesus says, hey, I have, I have a new commandment I want to give to you. Now, it wasn't new. It was the same one that was written in Leviticus, but they ain't been doing it. So Jesus said, it's just like it's new because you ain't never practiced it. A new command again, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. He said, love one another the way I have loved you. He says you need to express unconditional, non-reciprocable love to another person the way I've given it to you. Do you know, do you know, first of all, that this is impossible? So we spend our lives working to perfect it. That God loves us in a way that we could never love him back. Amen. Are, are you hearing me? You could never love God back the way God loves you. God is infinite. He is infinite, which means he has infinite power, infinite presence, but he has infinite knowledge. God knows everything there is to know. So you know he knows everything there is to know about you and about me. Amen? Because God knows everything there is to know about me, he knows things about me that I don't even know about me. And he chooses to love me in spite of what he knows about me. And he loves me infinitely, which means there is nothing I could ever do or even think that would make him love me any less. He could not love me any more or any less then he currently loves me irrespective of what it is my future may hold. Are you hearing me? The psalmist said in Psalm 139, I can't get away from him. He says, even if I make my bed in hell, he is there. Who is God? God is love. Do you know how hellish hell is to have a loving God loving you in a place where you have rejected him eternally? You can't love him back that way. You can't reciprocate that kind of love. No matter what you do, how hard you try, you could never love God the way he loves you. The mere difference of our natures mean we cannot love the same. And yet God, knowing our complete and utter inability to love him, chooses to love us anyway. And he says, love as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now, 
A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, love one another. The word love here is in the verbal position of the sentence. What that means is that the subject of the sentence is you and me, and we are doing something. So love to Jesus is a verb, not a noun. It is something that you do, but here's where you need a little bit of Greek to help understand this. It's not just a verb, but it is an active verb. Now you got active verbs in English. An active verb means that it's a passive verb means something that is done to me. And active verbs mean that the subject of the sentence is doing an action to love. So therefore he is saying, don't just feel love. I want you to do something that actively shows love. Because it is in the action that you do that Jesus defines what love is. But it's not just in the active tense. It is, it's not just an active voice. It's in the present tense. The present tense in Greek and in English both mean the same thing. In Greek and in English, it means an action that is being done in the present with no indication of its ever being completed. This means love and keep on loving and keep on loving and keep on loving with no indication of when it's over. He said, nothing shall separate us from that kind of love in Christ Jesus. Not height, not depth. And then it says, not peril, not famine, not sword, not even death can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus. Technically, when you say, till death do us part, that part shouldn't even be in there. Because death can't stop love. He says that you love what a, it's, it's, it, is, it is an active verb. It is in the present tense. But this part, it is in a mood. Every verb has a mood. Everybody say mood. The mood of this verb is a subjunctive mood. Subjunctive, don't write that down, but you just need to know what it is. Subjunctive mood means that he is saying it is the intent it is the action that is intended by the subject to do the verb. Even if you can't do the verb well or good, he says you give every effort you have to doing the verb. The, counter, the counterpart of subjunctive mood is imperative mood. There's actually an imperative subjunctive, but you ain't gotta know that. An imperative mood says, you ought to do it, I command you to do it. He says this is a commandment, but then in the commandment, he even gives in the commandment an extra push and says, even if you can't do it well, if you don't know how to do it, I want you to intend to do it with every fiber of your being to express your intention and deep desire to love someone the way I loved you. Give it all you got. Give it all you got. I can't take no more. Give it all you got. I'm tired of this. Give it all you got. Man, I ain't signed up for this. Yes, you did. You didn't just sign up for it, you paid $25 for it. You signed up for it, and then the preacher signed up behind your name. And you bought a tuxedo for it, you bought shoes for it. And then you went on a honeymoon and you had fun, didn't you? Signed up for it. All right, are you hearing what I'm saying? He says that you love with desire, with intent, with everything you have with all of your abilities. You give it everything you got to love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples. What is this, going to church? What is this, paying your tithes? What is this, being a good citizen? This is loving one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Are you guys still with me? Yeah. All right, so you, you, you love, the, you make a decision to love. He would not say it's a command. 
if he would not command us to do it if it was based on our feelings. Because you can't command a feeling. You can't command me to feel love. It's, it, that's, that, is, that, is, that is not compatible with the way the human psyche is made. We are not made to be commanded to feel on cue. But you can be commanded to choose on cue. And he says, this command is a choice that you need to make. Are you hearing me? All right, I want you to look at, not only is it a command, but it is to love the fullness of the person, all of them. In Romans chapter number five, <clears throat> In Romans chapter 5, it says, verses 7 and 8, for scarcely, or scarcely, whatever part of the country you're from, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even think about dying, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is individuation. This is the fullness of who I am. This is integrating all parts of me and God did not wait until I got myself together to love me. He loved me while I was still a mess. While I was still being worked on and while I still had issues and flaws and problems, while I was immature and hadn't figured it out yet, he loved me anyway. He loved me while I was still a sinner. I would suggest to you that it would not be real love if you did not have the ability to love me while I was still a sinner. Anybody can love somebody who is good or somebody who is righteous but can you love somebody who is wretched? Can you love somebody who made mistakes, who messed up, who flipped out, who did wrong, who went astray? Who, can you love somebody who is still a sinner? He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So whenever you walk around and you make requirements to do or be a certain way before you love them, you're not loving as Christ loved. Whenever you, whenever you withhold love from your spouse because they don't, they don't do it the way you want or they don't talk the way you want or they're not the person you want them to be, you're not loving as Christ loved. Whenever you punish your spouse by withholding love, you are actually hating your spouse because the opposite of love is hate, not like. Like is love's little sister. Hate is when you do something opposite of love. Are you hearing me? So you ain't talking this morning. You ain't got nothing to say to me. You walk around the house and you don't even know me. You give me the cold shoulder. You act like we don't even know each other in the same home. You don't understand. You do not require perfection before you love. It is love that produces the perfection. Man, I can't get no amens here. I'm gonna jump, I'm gonna jump to Ephesians chapter five. I need to look over here on this side. You're exactly right. <laughs> My friends are over here on this side. I don't know about the rest of y'all. <laughs> okay. Ephesians chapter five. Here's what it says in the, in the submission and headship you know, verses 21, 22, 23, 24. I'm gonna get there, but I wanna make sure I take my time and go through the steps. Verse 26 says that he might sanctify and cleanse the church with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to him, 
self. You see, he gets what he invested in. If he made an investment into her, then he gets from her the dividends of that investment. If Christ made no investment in the church, then he cannot present a glorious church to him because what makes the church glorious is the investment that he makes in the church. He says he, he may present the church to himself, a glorious church. Now look at not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that the church should be holy and without blemish. Now stop there, stop there, stop there, stop there. He did not love the church when the church got its blemishes fixed. It was his loving of the church that fixed its blemishes. Oh. Love is the medicine that healed the spots and blemishes of the church. We don't want love to be a medicine. We want love to be a beverage. We want love as a satisfaction and not as a medication. We want to feel love and not be healed. Love heals. Are you getting what I'm saying to you? Even whenever it doesn't feel good. How many of y'all have ever had cod liver oil? Uh-huh, uh-huh, raise your hands, I see you. Now, if you're, if, if you're under the age of 30, you don't know what that is. But cod liver oil, I believe that the devil invented cod liver oil to give parents an excuse to spank their children. I mean, we didn't get spanked for nothing else but cod liver oil. Time to take, how many of y'all have ever had 666? Now you know that's a bad medicine by the name of it. I mean, on theological grounds, I shouldn't be taking 666. That's the mark of the beast. You can't be asking me to take the mark of the beast. It's, it's bad tasting. It doesn't feel good. But if you take it, it will heal what's wrong on the inside. If you're loving as a beverage, just to satisfy and make everybody feel good. You don't say hard things. You don't hold anyone accountable. You don't confront issues when they come up. You don't communicate whenever it's a tough conversation. If you're loving as a beverage, that will only cause you to gain weight, to be OB, are you getting what I'm saying? But it doesn't heal anything. Sometimes you gotta sit down and have a hard conversation about stuff that hurts because love is a medicine. Sometimes we gotta make the decision to make sacrifices that we don't wanna make because love is a medicine. Sometimes I got to give up what I really want so you can have what you really need because love is a medicine. And if I love right, not immediately, not overnight, but over time, the spots and the blemishes start fading away. And I 
get, I'm 80 years old and she's 80, my Monica's 80 and I'm 80, we get to walk on a cane. But guess what? I'm gonna present to myself a spotless and glorious wife that I've been rubbing with the water of the word for the last 50 years. That's why we can sit and think each other's thoughts. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. It says, he will present her to himself. I said this in a lesson a few years ago in teaching this, that you get what you invest in. And if you don't invest in your children, you're not going to get, are you getting what I'm saying to you? Godly children don't just happen. You get what you invest in. A godly marriage doesn't just happen. You get what you invest in. If your marriage is not a godly marriage, don't throw in the towel. Make investments. Start now making investments. Do you have devotion together? Do you pray together? Do you worship together? What do you do after you argue? Do you fight fair? Do you talk sincerely? Do you allow for communication to be confrontation when necessary? Do you hold yourself accountable in front of your spouse? Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Because if you don't make those investments, you don't get the dividend. The dividend comes because you made the investment. It says, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. You love your wife as you love yourself. If you don't know yourself, then you cannot love your wife. If you don't know who you are, you will not know how to love your wife. It may be subjunctive, you intend it, but it will not be active. You will not know how to do what God has commanded. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying to you? Here is Dr. Tony Evans. Dr. Tony Evans, if you would go to that slide. Dr. Tony Evans says this about love being a choice. He says about love being a choice. Biblical love is a choice to do good for another person regardless of what we feel. It is a decision to compassionately and righteously pursue the betterment of another person. All right. All right, go back up, yes. Biblical love, there it is, is a choice to do good for another person regardless of what we feel. It is a decision to compassionately and righteously pursue the betterment of another person. All right, y'all still with me? Are we in the house, you good? Second thing about love, second definition for love. Number one, love is a choice. Number two, love is a compulsion. Everybody let the church say compulsion. Compulsion means something I just can't help but do. I just can't help but do it. It is an overwhelming urge to do. I'm compelled to do it. Love is a compulsion to seek the highest good and betterment of another person, even if at the sacrifice of myself. Love is a compulsion to seek the highest and the highest good and betterment of another person, even if at the sacrifice of myself. When you are loving and you make the decision to love, the decision being repeated over and over and over and over again becomes a compulsion. You literally get addicted to love. You literally get addicted to love, not to the person, but to the action. Whenever we think about an addiction to love, we think, I'm addicted to her. I'm addicted to him. No, no, not to the person, to the action. That you love by being compelled to do so. Something drives you to seek the betterment of the other person. Now notice, this compulsion is not a sexual compulsion. This compulsion is not eros, it's agape. 
It is a compulsion to seek the highest good and betterment of that other person. What is for that person's greatest good? What is their greatest good in this scenario, in this situation, at this season of their life? What is for their highest and their greatest good? We are compelled to do it. Second Corinthians chapter number five says to us in verse number 14, it says, for the love of Christ, there's our word, compels us. It's a compulsion, compels us. The love of Christ compels us. You cannot, you cannot love Jesus and not be compelled to love somebody else. You become addicted to the act of loving, addicted to the act of seeking the betterment of the one that you're loving. You do it automatically, consistently, all the time, all the time, all the time. Your mind thinks, what's their betterment? What's for their good? How is this good for them in this scenario? How is this best for them in this situation? Your mind starts going to work. What's best for them in their finances? What's best for them in their personal, uh, in their personal endeavors? What's best for them in the way they're thinking? What's best for them in their self-esteem? What's best for them in how they see and view themselves? You start thinking what's best for them, what's best for them, what's best for them, what's best for them. Best for them. That becomes an automatic compulsion. You're addicted to the act of loving that person. It becomes the natural passion and the natural desire of your heart, and that is to seek the other person's good. Now, you know who does this without training or should do it without training? Mother to baby. It's an instinct within the mom. It's called mother, mother instincts. It is this instinct within the mom that when the baby is in trouble or in need or in crisis, the mother hadn't had sleep for hours, automatically wakes up immediately because that mother is drawn by motherly instinct to be addicted to the betterment of her baby. Are you understanding what I'm saying to you? It is wired into the fabric of momhood. She knows the kind of cries the baby is making. She understands this cry is not like that cry. This, this, this cry, this scream is not like that scream. Immediately something within her goes into action because it is a compulsion. When you're married, you have to develop that muscle that compels you to seek the betterment of the one that you're loving. It compels you when I don't feel like doing it because I'm addicted to loving Monica. I have to do it. Something within me drives me to do it. Are you getting what I'm saying to you? There has to be the instinctive reaction Whenever you are loving, love is the compulsion. The love of Christ compels us because we judge us that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, and he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Here's what this verse means. He is saying that we are compelled to tell others to live for Christ because Christ died for you. By virtue of the act of Jesus' death, it has compelled us to live our lives for him. If he died for us, we should live for him. To do anything else would be unthinkable. It takes a cruelty of heart for a person who understands that Jesus died for them but refuse to live for Jesus. He says the thought is incalculable. How could you even decide that you are going to live against Jesus and you know that he died for you? Such a person must not know that he died if there is no compulsion to live for him. Are you understanding this? Marriage, love, Family is to have the same instinct. Oh God, help us to have that instinct. 
Help us to have that automatic compulsion. Let our hearts not grow callous and hard where we don't have a compulsion to seek the better of the one we're loving. Help us to be tender in the way we respond to our spouse, knowing that we are compelled to seek their betterment and not their detriment. May we not harm them with our words, with our looks, with our tongue, with our actions, with our neglect, because we are addicted to showing love to someone that we are in love. You're getting what I'm saying. Third thing, and then I'm going to end. Third thing. <clears throat> well, let's do this. Love is two goals. Before we go to number three, love is two goals. The first goal is to do what is needed for the highest good of the other person. The second goal of love is to give what is needed for the highest good of the other person. To do what the other person needs. That is the first goal of love. The goal of love is I need to do the actions that the other person needs. Now I've got to talk, I've got to communicate, I've got to ask questions, I've got to understand their needs, I've got to understand why they need it, I've got to know their background, their history, I've got to know their habits and what they do and what they don't do, what they like, what they don't. I've got to understand them in order for me to make a conscious decision on what it is that they need for their betterment. I can't do it for my betterment. I've got to do it for their betterment. I've got to do what it is that they need, and then I've got to give what it is that they need for their highest and best self. So, i got to give what they need. Here's how you know that you're giving what your spouse needs, is whenever you are determined to give more than you take. When you give more than you take, when your decision is to give, 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 and there's no expectation of return. You give more than you take, right? Man, all right, number three. Number three, and then I'm done, and then I'm done, and then I'm done. Are y'all still with me? Yeah. All right, love is not only a decision, and it is. Love is not only a compulsion, a drive, an instinct, and it is. Love is also an automatic response. Let the church say response. response. Love is a response is the response I give, not if give, I'm sorry. It is the response that I give, I wrote that wrong. Love is the automatic response I give when I understand another person's value. When I understand another person's value, it is the response I give. Are you, are you hearing, are you listening to me? It is that precious, that precious jewel that you have, that diamond that you have, you do something specific with it. You put it up, you put it away, you lock it away, you put it in its own separate little drawer, you get a little box for it, you put it in this little box because you understand the value of that diamond. And because you understand its value, you respond to it differently. That's love. I want you to capture this. I want you to hear this very clearly. Don't miss it. How valuable is your spouse to you? How much do you value them? What is their value in your life? Many of us don't know our value and we don't know the value of the people that we love. You have to understand how valuable they are, how much you need them, how critical they are in your life and in your experience. What is their value? What has God esteemed them as? What has God assigned in their life? What is their value? Because when you value them in the same value that God gives to them, you respond to them differently. Your wife is God's daughter, sir. Your husband is God's son, ma'am. What value do you have on them? If you keep saying they ain't nothing, they don't do nothing, they don't do nothing right, they always get it wrong, ain't never gonna be nothing. I'm sick and tired of them. The more you do that and you degrade them and denigrate them, the more you step on them, the more you devalue them, devalue them, devalue them, you will automatically respond based on the value that you place in them. 
What if you saw her as the queen that she is? What if you saw her as the apple of your eye? What if you saw her as the beautiful, majestic daughter of God that she is? What if you saw her as the one God gave to you to compliment who you are? What if you saw her in the full light of who she is? It would change how you respond to her. Whenever you focus on the flaws, the mistakes, on the things that are broken in the one you love, whenever you constantly remind them of what they are not, what they cannot do, what they do not have, whenever you cut down their self-esteem and their sense of self-worth and value, you will respond to them the way you cut them down. That is not love. Love is the response I give when I understand another person's value. Another person's value. Another person's value. That passage in Ephesians that we just looked at, I want you to look at it again. It says that he might present her to himself. Now look at what he's presenting. A glorious church. No spots or wrinkles. She's holy and without blemish. Look at what he's presenting. A glorious church. No spots or wrinkles. This is how I want you to see your wife or to see your husband. No spots, no wrinkles. What would you do if they didn't have that spot? How would you treat them if they didn't have that blemish? What reaction would you give to them if they didn't have that wrinkle? If they didn't have that flaw, how would you respond to them? Don't wait until the spot is changed. Respond to them now as if they don't have it. Because when you respond to them out of faith, are you hearing what I'm saying to you? You are washing them with the water of the word. You're washing them with the power of the gospel. You are washing them with the beauty of God's love. And you love them though they're spotted. You love them though they're blemished. You love them though they're wrinkled. You love them. You love them as if they did not have it. That is the automatic response that you give. Can I share something with you? God does not see you the way you are only. God sees you the way you will be. He takes note of your potential, not your position. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? If God were to treat you and act towards you based on where you are now, you'd be dead long time ago. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. It is the love of God that has driven us to repentance. It is the goodness of God that leads man to repentance. It is the grace and mercy and love of God that causes my heart to break, my knees to buckle, and my hands to raise before him. It is his love that draws me not his anger, not his ire, not his wrath, not his rage, not his name calling. It is the love of God that draws me to him. Love woos us. Anger repels us. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying to you? We cannot love that way because ego gets in the way. And when ego drives the conversation. When ego drives the interaction, I am offended, I am insulted, and now it's all about me. And the moment you love and it's all about you, that means you value you more than you value them. And that's not how God says we love. We are to esteem the other person as more valuable than ourselves. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying to you? Are you getting it? You get what you invest in. You present to yourself what you invest in. Now, don't raise your hand, but how many know that what I've been teaching, ooh, it's hard, hard to do. What makes it so hard is the movies you watch, the books you read, the soap operas you look at, the commercials for soda that you watch the magazines that you turn upside down to see. What makes it so hard 
is that the culture we love says the opposite of what I just got finished teaching. Whose report are you going to believe? Stand on your feet. All right, we got to go home. We got to go home. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to lift your hands before the Lord, if you would. Lord, I pray for every person that is under the sound of my voice or watching online. It's hard to do what we've been teaching. It's counter-instinctive and it's counter-intuitive. We've been told to get even with people who hurt us, to hate our enemies, to get them before they get us. We've been taught to distrust. We've been taught to not believe. We've been taught to get our needs met first. We've been taught to put ourselves in front of others. We've been taught that love is a feeling. We've been taught that when the feeling is gone, we have permission to vacate the marriage. We've been taught that family is temporary. And all kinds of scenarios can make up a family. We've been taught that fatherless homes is okay. We've been taught that mom can do it by herself if she wants. We've been taught that marriage and love is how we define it. So God, I lift my hands to you now. And I ask you to reprogram our thinking. Reprogram our thinking. Remind us that love is a decision. That love is a compulsion. And help us to see that love is a response to someone that we value. Break our heart. Rebuke our ego. Humble us down. Humble us down and we'll give your name praise Lord may this series be challenging and encouraging in Jesus name amen and amen again all right we're going to talk to those of you that are in the room first and then those of you that are online. If you're in this room and you know that God's called you to get out of your seat and give him your life and you know it, you know that you're not born again, you know that you're not saved and you know you need to be. And you've been debating it and talking about it for years and you've been running from God. You've joined 16 churches but you never gave your life to Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you and challenge you to get out of your seat right now and find the closest aisle that you can and get down to this front. We have a loving Discover New Life rep that's here waiting to receive you, Sister Tennant. Get down here right now if you know you need to be born again. Secondly, if you're in this room and you know that God's called you to join this church, You've been talking about it for a while and you've been coming for a long time, but you never did step across that line. You never did make that decision. Maybe you've dealt with some church issues in your past and it's making you think you don't need the church. You're here today because God brought you here. Don't walk out of that building. Don't walk out of this building saying the same thing you've been saying for months and months and years and years. Make a decision right now to get out of your seat and come find the closest aisle you can 
and get where God's called you to be. If you're here and you know that you're not born again and you're not saved, then you need to be. And if you know that God's called you to join this church, you get out of your seat. Come down front and get in the spot that God's called you to. Come on, saints of God, give God praise for these who are making their minds up. Come on and give the Lord praise for these making their minds up. If you're watching me now by stream, God bless you, God bless you. See this family, bless you so much. Good to see you, good to see you, bless you. If you're watching me by stream, I wanna just share with you that you need to give your life to Jesus Christ. The Lord loves you. He is waiting to give his best to you. All you gotta do is say yes to him. There is a Zoom link that's right at on the chat space. If you would just copy that link, put it in your browser, it'll take you to a Zoom room and you can leave your camera off, leave your heart on. If you know that God's called you to join this church, you do not have to live in Atlanta to be a connected to our church family. You can be a part of our virtual community no matter where you are. All you gotta do is just click that link or copy it and put it in your browser and it'll take you to where God wants you to be. You'll be in the Zoom room. There's loving leaders right now waiting to talk with you. I pray that you'll do it. If you're in the room and you're supposed to be down front, get out of your seat, make your way to come. We're gonna worship God for just a moment. If you're here and you know God's called you to be a part of the body of Christ, then get out of your seat and come. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Oh, there's no wall you won't kick down. Lift your hands in the presence of the Lord, would you? Coming after me, there's no shadow. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't. Tear down, coming after me. Father, we bless your name and we honor you and thank you for who you are and all that you've done. Thank you for your word today. Lord, I pray that your word would find a resting place in our hearts and our thoughts. We would meditate on your word. We would apply it to our lives. Teach us how to love, how to build our home on knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. And we'll give your name praise to the only wise God, our Savior be majesty, dominion, and power, now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen and amen again. I love you guys so very much. God bless you guys. We'll see you Wednesday online for Bible studies. What an amazing and powerful word. We just are so grateful that God showed up in the way that he did today. And we're grateful that you joined us to be a part of this experience. We have learned to love. Love is a decision. Love is a compulsion. Christ compels us to love. So I encourage you as you go into this week, love on your family, love on your friends, your coworkers. Give them the love that you would like to receive because that is what God has called us to do, to love on one another. I pray, Lord, that you help us see you and breathe you this week to experience your love and to also extend that love to others, to exude the fruits of the Spirit and one of those being love. And we are just so grateful for what you will do. We are claiming a blessing over this next week that we will experience. We praise you. We give you glory. We say thank you for all the ways that you have proven yourself to be good. In Jesus' name, amen and amen again. Thank you for joining and we'll see you Wednesday for Bible study where we'll continue to dig deeper into the aspects of relationship, family, and love.